Okay. Before we start, I want to thank you once again for coming to our seminar. The topic tonight is Countdown to Eternity. You are in for the most exciting Bible study adventure of your life. I want to begin by making a couple of promises. We are here to study Bible prophecy. What kind of prophecy did I say? Bible. Bible prophecy. In order to study Bible prophecy, you need to study the Bible. That sounds kind of elementary, but folks, you know, most of what we hear on TV, even hear from pulpits or hear on the radio, does not come from the Bible. It's people's opinions. And so we're not going to study about what you believe or what I believe, but what the Bible teaches. Amen? Amen. There's power in this book. It can speak to our hearts and change our lives. And this is what we want to study. If you commit to come to, come to this seminar on a regular basis, my second promise is this, that this book will come alive to you like it never has come before. You see, a lot of people think that the Bible cannot be understood, especially Bible prophecy is sealed or closed. They say it cannot be understood, but that's, that's hogwash, really. The Bible, you will learn some principles, simple principles, that will help you yourself to interpret and study and understand prophecies of the Bible. Um, you need to pay attention closely because every night we'll have a quiz. Not tonight, tomorrow, study tomorrow night. We will quiz you on the different principles that the Bible gives us how to unlock the Bible itself. Um, the reason why we do that quiz, we want you to learn. The third promise, and I want you to get ready to say amen to this one, is that we're not going to ask you for your money. We're not going to beg you for your money. We will take up a free will offering. If you want to give, give. If you don't, don't. Regardless, the seminar is free. Uh, there are individuals who have sponsored it, and if you want to, uh, want others to hear about these, these presentations, you're welcome to give. Um, now, with these promises made, I would like to make the most important promise. Is that this seminar is about Jesus. I hope you know him and you are following him. If you don't, I have a free book I would like to give to you. It's called Steps to Christ. You may receive it just by simply asking at the information desk and they will give it to you. And if you do know him and are serving him, then through this seminar, I know that your love for him will grow and deepen in ways you can only imagine. I would like to ask you to bow your heads with me as we once again ask God's Holy Spirit to guide us. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you for your Holy Spirit to anoint our minds, our thoughts, and open your scripture before us. Help us to understand it, follow it, put it into practice. This is a humble prayer in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. It doesn't take a lot to look at the world in which we live in today and tell we are headed for something. Something is going to happen. The world is nearing its end and the only hope lies in the soon return of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of my favorite Bible verse is found in Isaiah 46. It's page 733. Isaiah 46, verse 9 to 10. There God speaks through Isaiah. Isaiah 46, 9 to 10, page 733. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God says clearly that there is only one God. There is only one that can declare the end from the beginning. And I want us to begin tonight with chapter, Daniel chapter 2. We are going to lay a foundation for what we will be studying in the following nights. We will base the several next couple of subjects on what we will study tonight. You see, the book of Daniel is the foundation for the book of Revelation. If you read the, both of these books, you realize that they go together like peanut butter and jelly. They use the same kind of symbolism. John, whenever he speaks about, about uh, symbols, prophetic symbols, 
He refers to the book of Daniel as well as other pieces, uh, portions of the Old Testament. What we will learn tonight in Daniel chapter 2 is not only important for the subject we are covering tonight, but it's important for tomorrow's study when we study the topic, the Antichrist beast. Who is it? How is it presented in, in the Bible? Well, when we study the, on Monday, the Daniel chapter 8 and the judgment, and on Tuesday when we look at the rapture, all this will find its, find, find its basis in what we will study tonight. Because, you see, God uses a method of repetition and enlargement. Repeat after me. Repetition, repetition. and enlargement. enlargement. What happens is he will present something, and then he presents the same thing later on in different terms, but with more details, in a bigger picture. And so, you know, repetition serves for memory. It also helps you realize more, greater details. So, let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. It's page 879 in our seminar Bibles. Daniel chapter 2. You see, Daniel 2 is an amazing prophecy where God predicts the rise and fall of Earth's empires. Beginning 600 years before Christ's birth, taking us all the way through history until the second coming of Jesus and the rapture. And so this is one of the longest prophecies of the Bible. This prophecy is so amazing, so specific, so detailed, that many Bible critics have said somebody recently must have written the book of Daniel because they, it is so specific. But when you realize that this is God revealing things to Daniel, you'll find out that God really knows the future. And he wants to reveal those secrets to you and me so that we can look forward to the future without fear, even though things may be crumbling on, on the sides. It will affirm your faith in this book and will convince you that Jesus is about to return. So here's some background. Daniel is a captive Jew in Babylon. He's been taken from Jerusalem with all the other exiles to Babylon when Jerusalem was destroyed. He's one of the few men on the court of the king of Babylon who served the true God of heaven. He was highly educated. and He occupied one of the highest positions in the government. Now, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon had a dream. The dream was so vivid that he awoke startled. However, he could not remember the dream. Does that, has it ever happened to you? You knew something was very powerful. You wake up and, what was it? He could not remember what he had dreamed. So we will be studying about Babylon in the future topics. Particularly many of the false religious teachings find their beginnings in Babylon. Suffice to say that just about every pagan practice, every pagan doctrine or belief, just about every pagan religion in the world finds its roots in Babylon. Now, since Nebuchadnezzar was so startled by his dream, he, he called for the wise man that he had in, on his payroll to come forward and to explain to him his dream. First of all, tell him his dream. All the sorcerers, astrologers, and magicians, they came by, and he told them, give me the dream and its interpretation. Finally, the spokesman for, for this group of wise men, he went forward and he said, King, whatever you're asking for is impossible. Humans cannot read your dreams. Only gods can, can tell you this. It didn't take long for the king to realize that he had a lot of useless men on his payroll, supposedly wise men. And so he, was, he became so angry that he made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon were to be killed. Now, the decree also included wise men who were brought in from Jerusalem which included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his three friends. As the army captain went from door to door, dragging out the wise men, then he knocked on Daniel's door, and Daniel said, what's going on? And he found out that he was about to be executed. Daniel asked the captain to request from the king time for one night in which he would request God request for God to show to him what the dream was. Apparently Daniel believed in the power of God and the power of prayer. 
How many of you believe in the power of prayer? As Daniel and his friends prayed, God revealed the secret to him during the night. The same dream that God sent to Nebuchadnezzar, he gave to Daniel. And so, Daniel walk, wakes up, he realizes that God has heard his prayer and answered it. So let's pick it up with Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. Page 879. Daniel 2, 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. And so now Daniel now goes before the king, and so that the king asks Daniel if he knows the dream. Do you need more time? Let's continue the story in Daniel 2 verse 27. Daniel speaks to the king. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers show unto the king. Here Daniel pokes a little fun at the astrologers, at the wise men. He says, Those guys are, cannot do it. He reveals the inability. But verse 28, let's, uh, we have this here. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. See? Daniel said, there is a God in heaven. Don't you like that? He speaks to a pagan king and says, there is a God in heaven. What, what an opportunity to witness. And what does this God in heaven do? He reveals secrets. This verse says that God will re reveal secrets. He has made known what shall be in the what? Verse 28. What in be in the latter days? This dream refers to what days? Latter days. How many of you believe we live in the latter days? Amen. And so this dream refers to us. You and I have to, we better pay attention to this dream. The dream that the king Nebuchadnezzar could not remember that would, take, would be revealed to Daniel takes us from Daniel's time all the way through the stream of time to the latter days until when Jesus comes the second time. It's very important that we notice that this dream was for the latter days. Now, how many of let's, let's look at verses 35 to 30, 31 to 35. Thou, king, sowest, and behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This is a statue that he sees, an idol. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, who smote the image with, upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. So here's a representation of what Daniel saw. Uh, the king had this dream. He sees his idol. Nebuchadnezzar was used to worshipping idols. He sees a head of gold, the chest and the arms of silver, the thighs of bronze, and the legs of iron. But then the feet were made of iron mixed with clay. Suddenly, like a meteor, a rock comes and it was cut without human hands. It falls onto the feet crushes the image to dust, to power. 
and fills the whole earth. Now, friends, this is exciting. Guys, you will see that this is so specific that when we are done, you cannot tell me that God is not in control of this world. We may be afraid of what, what is happening in the Middle East, what is happening south of the border or in our own country. God is in control of this world. So let's begin. What does this head of gold symbolize? Daniel chapter 2, verses 37 to 38. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And whosoever the children of men, wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the head of gold. Who is the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. You see, the Bible makes it absolutely clear that Nebuchadnezzar is represented, or his kingdom is represented by the head of gold, which ruled from year 605 before Christ until 539 before Christ. Babylon, Babylon's kingdom was to rule the world, and it, ruled, and it did rule the whole world, the known, known world. It was a mighty nation. The city itself was 64 miles in uh, circumference. 64 miles. It's kind of Macau and Mission and Edinburgh together. It was the biggest city, the largest city on earth at that time. Its walls were some 300 feet high. Can you imagine 300 feet? It had two walls. The first wall was 25 feet thick. There was a second wall, 75 feet after the first wall, and that second wall actually extended 35 feet underneath the ground. So nobody could dig in underneath. Why was it called a city of gold? You see, first, Babylon was a religious center. There were over 50 pagan temples and shrines. There was a great temple of Marduk that rose high above everything. It was a, a type of a skyscraper. It looked like a pyramid that we find in Mexico or in Egypt. Then also the city was pictured as a head of gold because it was known as the golden city. There were the hanging gardens of Babylon. But in, in the city itself there was tons of gold. There was the image of Baal. There was this big golden table both weighing over 50,000 pounds of solid gold. There were two big solid gold lions at the entrance to the palace. And then there was this huge 18 feet tall statue of a, of a person, human figure, 18 feet solid gold. The Buchanan's palace was considered to be the most magnificent building ever erected on earth. As we have mentioned, the hanging gardens of Babylon. The river Euphrates ran right through the city of Babylon, supplying with fresh water and food supply. In fact, it was Nebuchadnezzar's greatest desire that his kingdom would remain forever. It was such a beautiful kingdom. I mean, you would expect it would last forever. And it would never come to an end. You might be interested to know that the site of ancient Babylon is about 60 miles south of the city of Baghdad in modern-day Iraq. The Time magazines had an article on uh, Saddam Hussein. It said that Saddam Hussein's hero was Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. In fact, just like Nebuchadnezzar had every brick that was made under his kingdom stamped with his name, Saddam Hussein started making bricks with his stamp and an image, one of the icons from Babylon. He wanted to be the second Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why did, he want, why did he like Nebuchadnezzar so much? You see, Nebuchadnezzar made his name in history by destroying the city of Jerusalem and taking the Jews captive for seven years. But as much as Nebuchadnezzar wanted his kingdom to last forever, God had other plans. Now, how many of us would have said, God, uh, King, you're the head of gold. Good night. But God had told Daniel to tell the whole truth. You see, we would have said, you are the head of gold, good night, King, and that's it. Let's look again at chapter 2, verse 39. 
And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear the rule over all the earth. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like that verse. He wanted his prophecy to be his way. In fact, if you turn to chapter 3 later on, read through the chapter 3, he decided he's going to have the whole image of gold. He set up a whole statue of solid gold in the plain of Dura, hoping to influence God's prophecy somehow. Somehow he thought he could change the facts of prophecy, but friends, he could not change prophecy. Neither can you and I. When God says something, he means it. Next kingdom would be Medo-Persia. The Medo-Persian Empire. Just as silver was inferior to gold, Medo-Persia was inferior to Babylon. Yet, they overthrew Babylon in 539 BC and ruled until 331. Now, how did Babylon fall, you ask, if it had so many walls? You see, King Belshazzar made a feast. He was the last king of Babylon, obviously. He had a great feast. On the very night of his kingdom, he would fall. He was throwing a big party, big banquet with plenty of wine, women, and song. Let's look at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Just a couple of pages to the right. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before them. Before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. These were holy vessels to be used in a debaucherous party. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and iron and of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the head that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosened and his knees smote against one another. How would you react? You see a handwriting on the wall. That's by the way where we get the saying, the handwriting is on the wall. But the Bible says Belshazzar was so affected that his knees started knocking against each other. The king immediately called his wise men together to read the inscription and none of them could understand it. But then the queen mother remembered that there was this old, old man by the name Daniel who knew how to interpret dreams and mysteries. So Daniel, a very old man now, he was brought before the king once again to interpret the message from God of heaven. And so we read in verse 24 of, of chapter 5. Then, then was uh, the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsim. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God had numbered the kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in balances and are found wanting. Peres. The kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Verse 30 we read, In that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, uh, Belshazzar was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Now here's something really amazing. 150 years before he was born, God identifies the general that would conquer Babylon. It is recorded in Isaiah 45, verse 1. Let's read this together. One, two, three. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates 
will not be shut. Cyrus wasn't even born yet. And God gives his name. God describes him. Not only does God give the name of the general, but he also told us how he would do it. How did the Medes and Persians overthrow the Babylonians? The Babylonians had 20 years worth of food supply. They had stored up plenty of food. In fact, when the Medes Persians came to the walls of, of Babylon, the, the Babylonians, they would, they would take pieces of bread and throw at the Persians, and they would mock them. They said, you guys are going to get old while we're still partying here. What happened is Cyrus dammed up the river Euphrates and redirected it so it no longer went into the city of Babylon. And he, in the night when Belshazzar was feasting and partying, the soldiers of, of Cyrus, went, of Darius and Cyrus, went underneath the, on the riverbed underneath the walls. You see, the, the soldiers inside of the city, they left the inner doors open. They thought, we don't need the double walls, we have the, the big wall. And so the soldiers went inside, opened the outer walls, and so everybody came in. And Babylon fell without one battle. This is how Babylon fell. But you see, friends, prophecy was fulfilled, and what's amazing, it was predicted, the details, 150 years before that. Now, the Bible named Babylon. The Bible names Middle Persia. The Bible names Cyrus as the leader. And this is why, one of the reasons why I love this book. You see, in an age where you don't know what you can trust, you can trust the Bible. Mm -hmm. The prophecy continues. Daniel chapter 2, verse 39 tells us that then, next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Now, what was the third kingdom of bronze that was to follow Middle Persia? Again, we don't have to guess. The Bible interprets itself. The Bible, a principle of understanding Bible prophecy is let the Bible interpret itself. And so what we do, we go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. It's page 890. Daniel 8, verse 20. The ram which thou sowest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. So we know, Medo Persians conquered Babylon. Under the symbol of a ram, we see the kings of Medo Persia of their kingdom. And then it says in verse 21, who would follow Middle Persia? Because we know brass followed silver. Verse 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia or Greece. And the horn, the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And so, just as the Bible says, the third kingdom was to be Greece that would rule the earth under the uh, rule of Alexander the Great. They quickly conquered the then known world, Middle Persia, and ruled all the way until 168 before Christ. Under the leadership of perhaps the, one of the best military leaders of all times, Alexander the Great, he was just 33 years old when he conquered all the way from Greece to India. He practiced a, a fast warfare. This is, there's an interesting story about Alexander's conquest and why it pays attention, why it pays to pay attention to prophecy. You see, Alexander, before he went on his conquests of Middle Persia, in Macedonia, where he was from, he once had a dream. He dreamt that he saw an august figure, an old man with a long beard, dressed in white, with some precious stones on his chest with a turban or a mitre on his forehead and a golden plague on the turban with some strange letters he had never seen before. He was so, he, he knew that this person was a holy person, but he was so terrified, he woke up in sweat. He shook off his sweat and he, he went on his conquests. Again, when he was coming towards Palestine, the dream was repeated. We are told by the historian Josephus Flavius, the story of it. You see, as the Greeks were conquering Medo-Persia, they were also conquering Medo-Persia's allies. You see, the Medo-Persian kings were the ones who allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple. So the Jews were allied with the Medo-Persians. As Medo-Persians were being attacked, so were the Jews attacked by the Greeks. 
And so, Alexander, when he woke up from this dream again, he got on his horse, he, he rode with his soldiers toward Jerusalem. And as he was entering, coming to the walls of Jerusalem, he saw a procession coming out of the city. There was the high priest and the retinue of priests following him. It was, a, it was with all pomp and glory, they were carrying some holy vessels and going straight to, the, to Alexander. And Alexander on his horse, he's looking down. He came to the high priest, and the priest, high priest and the priest bowed down before Alexander. And according to the historian, under the high priest's arm was a scroll of the book of Daniel. The very same prophecy that we study today. And according to Josephus, the high priest said to the Alexander the Great, O oh, great king, we know that you have come to conquer our city and our people, and yet we would tell thee of our prophet Daniel, who spoke and wrote of your victories. And the king stopped, he said, go on. And the high priest began to read from some of the same prophecies that we study today. And he shared with Alexander what Daniel had said in his great victories and how Greece would be the kingdom that would, cover the, that would rule the whole demon on earth. And so you see, the king was flattered. He was told, you're going to be successful. You're going to rule the whole world. And he spared the city, he spared the Jews. He went on to Egypt to conquer Egypt. See, friends, it pays to study prophecy. Because if you know what's going to happen, you can use it sometimes to your, to your advantage. And so this is why Israel, though they were allies with Medo-Persia, they were spared by the Greeks. Now the Bible goes on to say, finally in chapter 2, verse 40 of Daniel, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as I am. The fourth and final kingdom was Rome. It ruled from 168 BC until the middle of 4th century after Christ. It was a powerful kingdom that would rule the world for over 600 years. Here it is represented by the legs of iron. The great historian Edward Gibbons described it as the iron monarchy of Rome. He was not a religious man. Rome used the strength of iron in their swords. The Greeks actually used armor made of bronze. But iron cuts through bronze, cuts through all the other metals. You remember it was Rome that was ruling in the times of Jesus? Caesar Augustus that called for the census when Jesus was born. Now here, here's where the things get amazing. If you and I were predicting future, we'd say, we start with gold and silver, bronze, iron, uh, copper, zinc, tin, aluminum, and all. In other words, we would not know when to stop. But the Bible stops at iron. It doesn't give us six or seven kingdoms. It gives us only four world kingdoms. Let me ask you, those of you who know history, which kingdom conquered Rome? Kingdom, Rome was never conquered. Rome was divided was never succeeded by another kingdom. It wasn't overthrown by a fifth ruling empire. So this prophecy, in order to be accurate, it must describe a division in Rome, in the Roman Empire, hundreds of years before it, it would take place. So let's see what prophecy says. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. And whereas thou sowest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sowest iron mixed with mire clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Rome eventually got divided into East Rome and West Rome, like the two legs, eventually got divided into many different kingdoms. So the kingdom would be divided. The Bible says it shall be divided. How many toes does a normal person have? Ten. The breakup, breakup of Rome would have to be divided into ten kingdoms for it to be accurate. Here's, here's what's amazing. God says Rome will not be divided, conquered by the fourth kingdom, but it will be divided. And here's the list of kingdoms into which it got divided. Alemanni, obviously, is became Germans. 
The Burgundians became Swiss, Franks, French, Lombards became Italian, Saxons became the English, Anglo-Saxons. Suevi, the Portuguese, Visigoths, Spanish. Then there were also three others, Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. These were the ten Germanic tribes that infiltrated and settled in Rome, and as it went, as it broke up into ten different kingdoms, ceased to exist, and was superseded by ten kingdoms that these formed Western Europe. Those three, all right, those three are three kingdoms that do not exist anymore. Another fulfillment of prophecy, as we will study in future, in future topics. But here again, we see an amazing fulfillment of prophecy. Now, it gives it gets even more dramatic. Verse 43. And whereas thou sowest, I am mixed with my reclaim, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Here God predicted that these kingdoms would intermarry, but never unite. Throughout history, man has attempted to unite Europe by mingling seeds, that means intermarrying, marriage. God said that Europe would, would always be divided. Notice here is a painting on the wall of the Frederick Castle in Denmark. And here on the walls is a family tree of Europe. All the royals of Europe are shown how they are intermarried and how they're connected to King, uh, King Frederick and Queen Diana. You see, it's most of the times of history of Europe, they would intermarry with each other. They were all cousins. They would wage wars against each other, but they were waging those wars like cousins. They would send the soldiers, like playing chess. They tried somehow to unite Europe. I'm from Europe, and I, I can attest to this. We are so close to each other. You drive for three hours, and you, you have crossed two different countries. God said they would mingle their seed, but they shall not cleave one to another. Others have tried it. Hitler, Stalin, they tried, to, they tried to, by marriage, they tried by war. They couldn't. These few words have stopped them in their tracks. You see, Charlemagne tried to do it. He founded the Holy Roman Empire. It's like grape nut cereal. Have you ever had grape nut cereal? It's neither grapes nor, nor nuts. So the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman. But he just called it so that everybody gets united. He tried it, but it didn't work. The Bible said, they shall not cleave one to another. Napoleon tried it. Kaiser Wilhelm II tried it. Hitler. He tried to overrun the whole Europe and unite under one kingdom. Stalin, Lenin, Stalin. They all tried it. And today, there's a big effort trying to unite Europe financially. I can tell you, they still hate each other's guts. As close as they live to each other, they cannot stand one another. They know that for their finances, it's good for them. But because of the financial crisis, they say, well, let's, let us let go of those. Let us let go of them. Let's not be united after all. They shall not cleave one to another. When Napoleon defeated, was defeated in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, it is reported, he said, God Almighty is too much for me. He had all the Europe under his strength. And then somehow, although he outnumbered the enemies, he lost the battle. He said, God is working against me. It is wonderful to know that there is a God in heaven who is still in control of this world and he has a divine plan. Amen? Are you ready for the most exciting part of it? Verse 44 to 46. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. For as much as thou sowest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, and the clay, the silver, silver and the gold, the God, great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. God says in the time of these kings, of these kingdoms, 
He will set up His kingdom which shall stand forever. Amen? Amen. Means that everything is in its place. We are living in the toes of the image. And then this rock, great rock that will come out of outer space will destroy all the kingdoms, all the world as we know it, and God will set up His kingdom. Everything is placed. The next world kingdom will be God's. I want to be on His side. In Revelation 21, paints a beautiful picture of the coming kingdom. Let us read it together. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven had passed, and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from out of God, from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, a door for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Help me, read with me. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. You see, the next Bible says, that the days of these kings, what kings? The kingdoms of the divided modern Europe. Friends, the next kingdom upon this earth will be the kingdom of Jesus Christ. As Jesus was spending, here's a little graphic, I think. The rock, which is, is the Christ eternal kingdom. As Jesus was spending one of his last nights with his disciples on earth, he decided to tell them some encouraging words, which we found in John chapter 14. I believe we have it on the screen. Let us read those together. John 14, from verse 1 to 3. He made them a promise that he will for sure keep. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself again. So though I am, you may be also. Jesus said, I will come again. He will be the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. He will be the rock who will come and take care of business here on earth. Friends, this we can know for sure. Jesus is coming very soon. And he's coming to take, to take us all home. This is as far as we're going to go tonight. We'll study tomorrow. You don't want to miss tomorrow night's topic. Next presentation is the Antichrist Beast. One of the greatest warnings found in the Bible are in regards to the beast and its image. You want to know who it is. The God will not give us a prophecy and not give us clues how to find out what it is. May God bless you as you continue studying. Thank you for coming. As you leave, I would like to ask you, if you like tonight's presentation, take a couple of these with you. About your friends, co-workers, some family members. Let them come tomorrow night so they can Join you as we continue studying prophecies of the Bible. If I could ask you, we could stand maybe to close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you reveal secrets to us, sinful mortal. You care for us so much that you want us to know what you're about to do, what your plans are. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your, Holy, your Son, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. Thank you for the coming kingdom of Jesus. I ask you that each one of us standing here, present, will be ready for when Jesus comes. Help us to be faithful to you until then. Please protect us on our way home. Bring us safety tomorrow night. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Have a safe trip home. Good night.